It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here. It's lovely to have so many friends, staff, the faculty and students making work here today. It's, it's particularly fitting, I think, to have this moment, this ceremony, recognizing Helen and all that she did and brought to the college and to the world on a day that we call Bennington Works. You'll see a lot of other people here who are not here for this ceremony, admitted students and their parents and grandparents, and as someone said to me, an almost parent. I'm not sure what that means, but we'll take it. <laughs> <coughs> and it's wonderful to, to be walking around today and hearing current students showing and talking about their work in progress, talking about their creative process and showing their creative process. And as I said, it seems particularly fitting that we should recognize Helen on such a day. I'd like to extend a special welcome to the trustees of the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation. There they are with all their sunglasses on. You all have, <laughs> you're looking very incognito over there, but not really. <laughs> the very exhilarating task of stewarding Helen's legacy, and we're thrilled to be doing that work with you. Helen's nephew, Clifford Ross, stepdaughter, Lee's Motherwell, who herself attended Bennington in the 70s, Michael Hecht, who brings his clear eyes and steady hands both to the foundation and the college's board. Their fellow trustee, Fred Eisman, also Helen's nephew, couldn't be here today, but we are pleased to have the foundation's executive director, particularly Elizabeth Smith, here with us as well. As the president of Bennington College, I'm looking at Liz, <laughs> this is about as good as it gets. <laughs> Helen once described her college years in this way. Maybe we should get the admitted students here to hear this. All of my Bennington memories melt into one joyful stream of laughter, invention, serious concerned pursuits, intense friendships, and the opening of my already analytical mind. She could have been writing the mission for the college. And what she did with that experience, it doesn't happen too often, <laughs> six decades of tireless experimentation opening frontiers and carving new ways forward, a life centered around inspired and inspiring work. This is what we hope for for our graduates. Most of you here know well Helen's accomplishments, major retrospectives at the Whitney, the Guggenheim, the National Gallery, MoMA, the winner of the National Medal of Arts. I could go on. What you may be a little less familiar with is her range, the stories that I have heard about her wit, her poetry, her extraordinary analytical mind. Consider this example from her Reflections of Bennington. I look back on a parade of faces in classrooms, Eric Fromm and his magic, Freud, the Bible, and Spinoza, all crowding my writing and dreaming life. Hers was a genius that marries artistry and intellect with profound results. I can think of no better way to honor the legacy of Helen Frankenthaler, Bennington class of 49, one of the great American artists of the 20th century, than to commemorate her impact and influence on the future. I am extraordinarily grateful to the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation. I say that not only on my own behalf and on behalf of the faculty and staff, but most importantly on behalf of the students and the students to come. Thank you for establishing the Helen Frankenthaler Fund for the Visual Arts. Together, we will ensure that Bennington continues to be a place where students are encouraged to make their best, their most surprising, their most inspiring work, as Helen did. 39 years ago next month, Helen Frankenthaler spoke at the dedication of this building. I'm thrilled, we're all thrilled, that it will now bear her name. Joe, Steve, I present to you the Helen Frankenthaler Visual Arts Center. <laughs> it's now my additional pleasure to introduce Alan Kornberg, Chair of the Bennington Board of Trustees and member of the class of, am I allowed to say it? 
74. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, Helen became an artist at a place and a time when the art world was literally exploding around her. What was clear even then, certainly to her teachers and classmates, if not to Helen herself, was that she would be a leading light excuse me, uh, in, in the next wave of contemporary art, and she was indeed. When Helen was here, she studied with the painter Paul Feely, as well as with some of the great intellectuals of the 20th century. Kenneth Burke, Peter Drucker, Ralph Ellison, Eric Fromm. In her own words, there were many wild and brilliant teachers on campus, inspiring. You could only want more, and they gave it. It was in 1950, at an exhibition of artworks by Bennington graduates held in New York, that Helen met the renowned art critic Clement Greenberg who was deeply influential in the early phase of her career. Greenberg was a frequent visitor to the Bennington campus, as was Helen, often bringing with them innovative artists. The list is a who's who of contemporary art. Joseph Cornell, Adolf Gottlieb, Hans Hoffman, Morris Lewis, Barnett Newman, Kenneth Nolan, Jackson Pollock, Larry Poons, William Turnbull, Isaac Witten, Witkin. Many of these artists received their first solo exhibitions outside of commercial galleries right here at Bennington. It was a very heady time. Helen remained committed to Bennington throughout her lifetime. Her work was presented here in solo exhibitions in 1962, 1978, and 2007. She served as a trustee from 1967 to 1982, and as Marco noted, she was here for the dedication of this building. It would give her great pleasure, we know, that on this very special occasion, we are also announcing that the painting studio in the Helen Frankenthaler Visual Arts Center will be named for her teacher and mentor, Paul Feely. In this way, this building embodies the reciprocal nature of a Bennington education. Mentor and apprentice, protege and sage. Our faculty stands apart to this day for its capacity to create a dynamic classroom experience, made richer by their experiences and perspectives as practicing artists. Thank you to the Foundation for helping us ensure that it will continue to be so for generations to come. Paul Feely's granddaughter, Vanessa Harnick, was not able to be with us today, but she did send these words as managing trustee of the Paul Feely estate. And, and these are her words. Helen Frankenthaler was in the first painting class Paul Feely taught after returning to Bennington from the war. One of the many things he taught her was how to take apart and put back together paintings in new ways. In so doing, he and Helen embarked on a whole new path in this post-war period, very different from one another, and yet still sharing and learning from one another. Helen wrote that Paul was a marvelous teacher because as a painter himself, he seemed to creatively wrench from his students the questions that he himself wanted answers to, yet steering us, opening up new possibilities. Mere months after the Paul Feely Memorial Retrospective at the Guggenheim in 1968, Helen Spear headed the fundraising for the new visual arts and perform, uh, new visual and performing arts center at Bennington College, and introduced the idea of naming the painting studios after Paul Feely. At the dedication in May of 1976, Helen said, Paul's reactions to this event today would have been laughing embarrassment to hide his great sense of pride in the place. Overwhelmed by the side of the building, its great facilities, enormous spaces, and the anticipation of what they will hold, excitement similar to starting a fresh campus. If only they were both here to celebrate this great occasion. Um, I would now ask Clifford Ross, uh, chairman of the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation Board of Trustees, to say a few words. I'll say a few words in a moment, but first I want to introduce Lise Motherwell, uh, one of our trustees, and uh, will have probably better words than I to speak today. Thank you. 
Um, hi, I am uh, Helen Frankenthaler's stepdaughter, and uh, she was married to my father at a time um, uh, that was developmentally really important for me from about the time I was four to 16. Uh, she also was the person who encouraged me to apply to Bennington and to come here, and I had a really wonderful experience. Sometimes you find a place that's exactly your place, and this is what Bennington became for Helen, as everybody has said. It was a place where she was uh, uh, developed intellectually, emotionally. She uh, made friends with people that she had for life, um, and I think even though she was a uh, born and bred New Yorker, uh, Bennington was the place that she really, really loved. And I don't know if you know, but she was also buried here. And that's how much um, Bennington meant to her. Um, I think in terms of the foundation, we were thrilled to have given this gift to Bennington. Um, we hope that all the creativity and innovation and um, the opportunity to explore that Helen experienced will be carried on for the next generation of students. Thank you. That pretty much, I think, wrapped things up uh, well, so this will be brief. Um, I, uh, when I was on my way here, uh, we passed through uh, a spot where there's going to be a, a little gathering after, and there were a number of photographs of Helen uh, during her years here. Um, Helen was very photogenic, um, and there have been marvelous photos of her taken over the years. Um, and there are two photos which I think stand out in particular. Uh, one which came many years later uh, when she had accomplished extraordinary things is a picture taken of her in front of Mountains and Sea, her famous picture, uh, with David Smith. And it is so clear that David is absolutely delighted to be seated next to this beautiful, brilliant woman in front of this picture. Um, that's one of the two. Uh, and a lot of us in the family have always enjoyed it. Uh, there's a picture that became known to some of us only recently, um, and that's my other favorite picture. Uh, for some reason, it's not up today, and uh, Mariko, who we all thank very much, and also Liz Coleman, who was, was such a great friend uh, to Helen for so many years, um, you said something about sort of being sure things were kept on a straight path, um, maybe worried about the Frankenthaler tradition. Well, this, this picture that wasn't up today is a picture taken in the dead of winter, in the snow, of four women playing poker outside on a bridge table. Um, I think that picture says everything about Helen and Bennington. Um, Bennington is a place where Helen learned, I think, to be free and to use the genius she had. Um, I think artists unfold at different rates. Um, I see uh, Lauren Olitsky here, and with Lise, Lauren, th there's, a, there's a whole generation of us now who have, we've outlived parents and aunts and uncles and so on. Uh, but the great legacy we have, I think, is one of energy and curiosity. And, um, you know, we're very lucky to be able, we feel, to make a gift uh, here to Bennington. Uh, it's not only what Helen would have wanted, but it's what Helen taught us to want for everybody. Uh, Bennington really stands for the kind of excitement that goes with creativity. Um, I want to mention just one other thing. There was one person who, in particular, helped us be aware, alongside of Lise, about the appropriateness of taking such a big step for a fledgling foundation. Um, Elizabeth Smith, who's been noted before, is, is really forging an amazing path for us. But Michael Hecht has been devoted to Bennington. And if I got it right, Michael, I think uh, Helen suggested you step in uh, when she perhaps pulled back a touch. and. Um, uh, Michael really was a guiding force to make us realize we had this great opportunity. So really our thanks go from the foundation to Bennington uh, for giving us an opportunity to further Helen's legacy and really create the kind of uh, uh, aura around Helen uh, that she learned during her formative years playing poker in the snow. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, uh, I'm John Isherwood. I teach sculpture here at the college. Um, this is an honor, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the foundation on behalf of the VA faculty, students present and students future. Bennington is unique and whatever occurs here transfers to another discipline. There are no boundaries to the way in which this grant will manifest itself across the campus, the community and the student body. Please know that already we've generated a lot of ideas for the student programming, curricular development and building improvements. I think our Google Doc nearly crashed from the extensive dialogue and volumes of ideas generated in the past few months. I want to talk a little bit about the name Helen Frankenfowler and what it signifies. I want to propose that the name signifies an encounter, an unexpected meeting with someone or something. If you listen to Helen closely, look at her career and her contributions, her life and art is about encounters. At Bennington she encounters art, literature, philosophy and a breadth of liberal arts ca classes. She encounters Paul Feely and Cubism. For Helen Frankenfeller, Bennington did not mean a brief brushing with art history, it meant an entanglement and an exploration with ideas and concepts to understand art. She encountered Bennington in an immersive sense and the way in which an encounter provides ownership for an intellectual life. Looking at a Helen Frankenfeller painting is not for the faint of heart. It's not a brief interlude, it's an encounter. She takes you to the canvas, canvas raw, canvas vacant, canvas that changes the course of art. You follow the colour as it comes off her brush, the encounter is live. She asks you to be with her, side by side, sharing that journey. When she finds herself on travels without paint, we experience the urgency she has to capture the light and the colour. She takes the liners out of a set of drawers in the hotel and works with lipstick, eyebrow liner and blush. The encounter is improvised, immediate and urgent. She's invited to work with Anthony Caro in his studio in London and to make work from David Smith's steel. Interestingly, Carol has not managed to do anything successfully with this steel. The studio is weighty, steely is the material, and welding is the process. She rents a Mercedes convertible, stays at the Ritz, and shows up in capri pants. <laughs> the material is laid out on the floor. What does she do with it? She decides to deny its gravity. She hangs the metal from the roof trusses in the studio and makes an incredible sculpture called Ceiling Horses. Ten sculptures in total are completed in two weeks. Nothing is passive. She has the confidence to break the rules, turn the sculptor's world upside down. The lineage of her work carries a message, creates an encounter that challenges, takes nothing for granted. Risk is all we have to keep art alive and moving forward. On Helen's last trip, last trip to Bennington to attend the opening of an exhibition I organized of these sculptures, we were in the Usedan Gallery. I knelt, I knelt down next to her and we were gazing at a painting called Red Square, a painting that was, painted, that was made in 59 and belongs to the college. I asked her if this painting had been influenced by Matisse's Red Studio, making a leap of faith, hoping she was going to say yes and it would resolve my questions about the work. I watched her eyes dart around, around her eyes darting around the picture as if she was painting it all over again. She touched my hand, smiled. I nodded and I said thank you for what had been yet another encounter with Helen Frankenfeller. Helen always asked about Bennington. What are the students up to? What are the, what's showing in the gallery? Who's teaching up there? She cared about the college deeply. So I think that the name on this building asks that we encounter and question deeply that that moves life and art forward. The last words I remember from Helen were as follows. John, send my love to Bennington. Helen, this is a lot of love. Thank you. <laughs>
and a kind of contextualized and yet completely new work that she made is still possible here and will forever be. Thank you. <laughs>